Ben Wattenberg. On this special edition of Think Tank, we leave our usual studios to take a look at the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. We begin at TR's beautifully restored birthplace in downtown Manhattan to talk with John Milton Cooper, professor of history at the University of Wisconsin and author of The Warrior and the Priest, Woodrow Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt, and Douglas Brinkley, director of the Eisenhower Center at the University of New Orleans and co-editor of Theodore Roosevelt, Many-Sided American. After that, we will talk to the man who now sits in Teddy Roosevelt's old governor's seat in Albany, New York, who is not only a student of TR, but sees modern applications from his model presidency, Governor George Pataki. The question before this house, was Teddy Roosevelt the model of a modern major president? This week on Think Tank. Theodore Roosevelt was a central figure in 20th century America. From 1895 to 1897, he was the police commissioner of New York City. When the battleship Maine was sunk in Havana in 1898, he organized and led the Rough Riders to victory over the Spanish forces in Cuba. His war hero status catapulted him into the governorship of New York State in 1898. Teddy Roosevelt left the governor's office to run on the Republican ticket as vice president with President William McKinley in 1900. Six months later, Roosevelt acceded to the presidency when McKinley took an assassin's bullet. TR was the first politician to relentlessly take his case to the people and he campaigned for his programs throughout the country. He believed that an active central government was necessary to control big business and to protect against monopolies. These views caused a break with many of his fellow Republicans. TR was also a progressive on the environment. An ardent naturalist and conservationist, he helped create the national park system in the West. He also cared deeply about immigration, which he felt was the lifeblood of America's greatness. Perhaps most importantly, Teddy Roosevelt advocated a strong and powerful United States in world affairs, from the Panama Canal to the Great White Fleet. After he left the presidency, Theodore Roosevelt led the Progressive or Bull Moose Party in a failed third party attempt to capture the presidency. Roosevelt's life continues to inspire both progressives and conservatives, as we shall see. A good place to learn more about Theodore Roosevelt is in downtown Manhattan near Gramercy Park. This gracious brownstone was the birthplace of Theodore Roosevelt. Gentlemen, uh, welcome. Um, why is Theodore Roosevelt on Mount Rushmore? John? Because, well, the short answer, Ben, is because Guts and Barklam was a friend of his. The sculptor was a friend <laughs> and political follower. Uh, more so, though, Theodore Roosevelt, as you suggested, uh, is the first modern president. Uh, the president who dominates the, the political agenda, who sets the political agenda, and especially one who uses uh, the public media. Uh, it's interesting, a lot of the stuff that we associate today with uh, the electronic media, uh, both for good and for ill in its effects on politics, uh, Theodore Roosevelt was actually able to accomplish in the days before the electronic media, in the days where, where a president had to make his impression on the public through the print. Uh, part of it was he had such a vivid personality. He was such a vivid personality. He also had such a feel for how to do this, which I think was mainly an instinctive feel. It's not something that he studied or trained to do, but uh, that's a lot, a lot of it. And uh, the imperial presidency, what uh, has often been decried that way, I think certainly we have to associate with him. Was he sort of out of the ordinary run of the mill of presidents at that time? Oh, uh, he, was, he was very much out of the ordinary. Um, you know, one of the things about Theodore Roosevelt, he doesn't fit into any real category. Here is a man at a very early age um, you know, in his 20s, uh, was in politics, but he was also a rancher, 
He was a cowboy. He was a writer. His, his book on the uh, War of 1812 naval history is still one of the classics, which he did as a very young man. His multi-volume uh, history of the West. Um, he's somebody who was um, an early naturalist, somebody who came onto the conservation movement early, somebody who understood the need for a big navy, um, who understood the, the, the moment in history when America was gaining, becoming an imperial power. Roosevelt was a lot of things to a lot of different people. And um, I think that his, um, he comes the first modern American president um, is correct, but I think we have other, I, I think I would look at him as a Renaissance man. I think he, if I had to compare him to, in scope to other American figures, I would look at Ben Franklin or Thomas Jefferson. I think Theodore Roosevelt really belongs in that company. In that sense, it's, it's very odd that this, this most modern of American presidents was in a certain way a throwback as well because he is a great amateur, he's an aristocrat. I mean, this house we're sitting in, this, is, uh, this, is, this was one of the most fashionable areas of New York. Uh, this man and Franklin Roosevelt are our two real aristocrats as president. They come from an upper class, and you know, that's not just, not just upper middle class, but people who've had their money and their social position so long that they actually look down on the rich and have a very different attitude uh, toward them this than the rest of us do. Oh, absolutely, kind of absolutely, absolutely. In today's context, would, would would Theodore Roosevelt be regarded as a liberal or a conservative? Oh boy, um, I would say both. Um, I think that um, you know it just depends on what one means by those terms. I'm unclear anymore. I mean, is a conservative cons being a conservationist? That's somehow the environmental issue and conservation is considered a liberal issue, right. when it maybe it should be a conservative issue. I think you almost have to look issue by issue with Theodore Roosevelt. He liked big government in some ways. He created the Food and Drug Administration, the Forestry Service, the Department of Labor, the Department of Commerce. These are all Theodore Roosevelt, you know, expansion um, measures. I don't know. To, to me, though, that, that just, I don't think big government the size of government is a liberal versus a conservative issue. I think that's gone in through different incarnations at different times in, in our history. Uh, it's interesting that you know, T.R. never admired Thomas Jefferson, never had any use for Thomas Jefferson or whatever. He was because. always... Be why, why not? For two reasons. I think one is because Jefferson he saw as a devotee of small government. The other thing was he saw Jefferson as a panderer. In other words, that Jefferson represented uh, serving people's or groups' self-interest. And government shouldn't do that. That's not what democratic politics should do. He believed, I think he believed in a kind of evangelism. You know, he, he's the one who coined the term bully pulpit. And he was a kind of political evangelist. And I think what he believed was that the function of a democratic leader was to get people to rise above their interest, to have some vision of a transcendent national interest. That's, that's what he meant by the new nationalism when, when he ran was, in 1912. When, when, when he was, uh, 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 in office was this uh, phrase manifest destiny. What, what did that mean? When did it come into being? And how does uh, well, Theodore Roosevelt uh, fit the in? The term manifest destiny came um, really into vogue in the uh, 1840s with the Mexican-American War. The idea that it was America's God-given right to sweep across the continent, to have a sea to shining sea. Um, and James K. Polk exemplified that in the Mexican-American War. Underneath it's this notion of American exceptionalism. And I think Theodore Roosevelt was imbued with the idea of American exceptionalism, that, that there's something unique about America that's different than the rest of the world. And I think it, it, it changes a little bit to him when he uh, discovers Alfred Thayer Mahan, the great naval strategist. And I think it becomes an Anglo-Saxon kind of superiority in the world. Mahan talking about Great Britain being you know, the supreme country because it has a great navy and it can defend all of its um, all of its shores, and I think Theodore Roosevelt really grabbed onto that, and I think his manifest destiny comes to meet Mo the Monroe Doctrine in Theodore Roosevelt, with the uh, Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine of 1905, which really put teeth in the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine was sort of a sp the speech of 1823, um, you know, that President um, Monroe gave, um, John Quincy Adams wrote, which said, this is our hemisphere. But, but not really, it meant that we were gonna, that, that's what it's got interpreted at, to mean by the end of, um, by the time Theodore Roosevelt had his way with it, the Spanish-American War of 1898 is the beginning of American imperialism. Up until that time, it really is manifest destiny, meaning settling the continent.
you know, from the East Coast to the West Coast, settling California. But by 1898, with President McKinley and Ro Theodore Roosevelt inherits this, we have empire. We have the Philippines. We have Cuba. We have Guam. We have Ohio, or um, we have no, Hawaii. Have <laughs> but you have the American flag in the, in, so, in the so Philippines. What you're saying is the, the difference between Manifest Destiny and American imperialism is one extra hemisphere. It's, it's the and, and, it's, and it's the assertiveness. It, for, for TR and for his friend Henry Cabot Lodge and their crowd, it wasn't just enough for us to be exporting our values and having this nice benign influence in the world. We've got to get out there and use our power. We've got to exert ourselves in the world. We've got to spread our influence much more forcefully. He really believed in that. The other thing is American Do exceptionalism. Do you believe in that? Depends upon what my, my mood at the time. Uh, I mean, you're sometimes. talking of it. Sometimes. You're yes. talking of it sort of critically. Well, you see, a belief in American exceptionalism. And, and, and yet I'm sure you, are, you would not characterize yourself as an isolationist. Oh, no. No, no, no. Although isolationists weren't all that bad either. No, in fact, <laughs> isolationism is based on a belief in American exceptionalism too, which is that because we are so good and so much better than the rest of the world, we need to set the right example. Yeah, but but, but Roosevelt was an internationalist American exceptionalist. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And it was at that moment in yes. time, I mean, it, it, it was, you know, there's a great opposition to the Spanish-American yeah. War from people ranging from William James to Mark Twain that were against just what McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt were doing, which was going too far. But I believe that it's part of the American character. How, that, how did that go too far? Just well, because we, you, start, my you start having Pacific Empire. I mean, it's one thing to be settling California and kicking the Mexicans out of, of what's today the Southwest. It's a whole other thing to have to have a coaling station in Hawaii for ships to then have empire in the Pacific, all because you want the open well, China market for trade. Seem, but, but how does that relate to Cuba, which is where Theodore Roosevelt fought? Well, because to control the hemisphere, that's the Monroe Doctrine uh, idea that we're going to keep foreign intrusion, keep the Spanish out of the hemisphere, keep the, later the Russians, the British, whoever, out of this hemisphere because it's going to—it's essentially that American was part trade of the, line. That was the Spanish-American War. Yes, that's but, and, and, but it, Hawaii it, and, and the Philippines antedate that. No, no, it's, no it's the booty. Part of it. We win it. Part of it. Yeah. the Spanish-American yeah. War. Yeah, I mean, we gained the Philippines as a—that's uh, our war booty. Well, now suddenly we're teaching America that. Today, the Philippines aren't speaking British English, they're speaking American English. It's American flags there. We are now imposing American values thousands of miles away from our shore. And one could argue it's uh, over You're talking about during Theodore Roosevelt's time, yes. not today. Uh -huh. right. And yeah. I'm talking yeah. about it's beginning, what some people would argue is overextension of, um, of American okay. empire ben, to our country. Ben, if we hadn't gone into the Philippines when we did in 1898, as Theodore Roosevelt wanted, I mean, why did we do it? These people wanted us to have a permanent presence in Asia, and they got it. And what we got from that was we got Pearl Harbor and we got Vietnam. If we hadn't taken the Philippines, if we hadn't done that in 1898, I do not believe we would have fought either of those major wars in Asia. I am not entirely convinced, though, that our participation in those wars is the best chapter in our history. And I, I, including World War II. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd even, I would even, even argue some of that. I think there, I think there's some real questions about what we were doing there, and I'm not trying to make the Japanese seem, seem good oh, either. Yeah, but no, I, I think there's some real questions about that. I think our I European think, role is something else. I think at yeah. that point it was inevitable, and I think American role in the Pacific was a great triumph of the beating of the Japanese. The point I'm making is this is committing us there. There are consequences for moving in for trade into the Philippines and into that kind of, kind of um, Asian expansion, and the consequence are having to deal with the Japanese in this sort of way for crisis with the Manchurian crisis in 1930, early 1930s. We almost went to war in Asia again. Um, that's because we now are in other let, people's let backyards me, let, and we are imperialist powers and we're gonna end up meeting what imperialist powers have always met, a, 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 a backlash from people where we're at. Uh, president uh, Clinton will be the first president to serve in the next century. He, I believe, has fashioned himself as a Theodore Roosevelt-like president, and some people have compared him to that. There, there have been some conversa there were some conversations late at night in the White House with that distinguished political philosopher Richard Morris, uh, kind of discussing <laughs> uh, discussing whether Clinton's role would be TR-like. Does that resonate? Not to me. Uh, I don't see in Bill Clinton uh, many of the qualities of Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt's a man, as we said before. Not a rough rider, was he? Well, not just so, not only not a rough rider, but somebody who was, you know, he was not a man who wrote 50 books. He was not a man who, um, 
who had the kind of that type of intellect. I see Bill Clinton much more like Franklin Roosevelt in the sense of um, being a master political, um, you know, manipulator in many ways. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. For FDR is a, you know, a great hero, but um, you know, Theodore Roosevelt lost. A lot, remember. I mean, or I mean, here's a man who served one term, came in as a fluke because McKinley was assassinated, won one term, then promised I'll never run again, then wish he would have, then created a bull moose party, then almost ran in nineteen in, in nineteen twelve yep. and lost, almost ran in nineteen sixteen. I think he was a man of of a large amount of principle, um, in principle, of what he believed in was right and acted wow. upon it. And I think President Clinton's reads the public opinion in a way a little bit more. Um, it doesn't lead out in front of the people and bring them on there. Well, I think I'll, he's okay, responsive. Let me, let me disagree. Let me disagree with Doug on that. I think there are certain ways in which I think Clinton does, does resemble Theodore Roosevelt. One is, in fact, in most of his presidency, as opposed to his ex-presidency, where I think he plays a very different role, Theodore Roosevelt, in fact, isn't out in front. He is testing the public opinion constantly. He'd be very, very careful, with one exception, the only exception, the only real leadership role he plays as president is in conservation. He does get out in front. He does agitate on that. The other thing he did... The, the, the progressive reforms, in other words, were coming anyway, and he sort of guides them well, in, what, incrementally. Is what, that what well, you're saying? What he does, I think it's even more Ben than, than being incremental. I think he's stealing or co-opting from his opposition. I think, in some ways, I think he... Clinton has been doing with some of the Republican issues of the last two years exactly the same thing that Theodore Roosevelt did. With he Brian's is, issues. With Bri exactly, with Brian's issues, the issues mm -hmm. of Brian and the populace. What he's doing is he is stealing their thunder and often to the unhappiness of his own party. In, in an era like today's of sort of political correctness, could a man as brash and blunt as Theodore Roosevelt survive in political <laughs> life? I don't think he could have gotten elected Police Back commissioner. then, oh, right, right. I think it was a fluke. He became the vice presidential candidate, and then um, you know assumed the presidency when when McKinley um, you know was shot. I don't think it would. I thought I think it would have been very difficult for him to have mounted his own national campaign and to have won at the turn of the century if it wasn't well, for that that circumstance. I'll, I'll disagree with that too. <laughs> I think Theodore Roosevelt is th this whole business of the self-made man versus the aristocrat. From the moment he walked into the legislature in Albany when he was 23 years old, he had reporters assigned to him. He never knew an hour, a minute of political obscurity. Once he becomes governor of New York, I think that's the key thing. From the Civil War to World War II, it is the exceptional election that doesn't have as one or both candidates for president a governor of New York. That's the launching pad now, to become president. He gets there faster because of the vice presidency and because of the McKinley assassination. I well, think he well, was but, but, and, and he got there because of the war in Cuba. That Spanish-American War, though, he didn't have to become the great hero out of that war. In every other, our earlier wars, it's the commanding general. It's the U.S. Grant. It's the Zachary Taylor. It's the Andrew Jackson who becomes the hero. This colonel, the Rough Riders, this guy who leads a charge up San Juan Hill, again, was that's... Was he a, uh, a media hustler? Heck yes, of course he was. He even had movie cameras going along, primitive movie cameras. He took some, got some horses out of the way so that uh, he could have those movie cameras go along with him. I mean, he, wants, he has photographers, he has reporters, he has movie cameras. You bet he was. What is his legacy? What should we learn from that man on Mount Rushmore? The one that I would like to make a point about would be conservation. The fact that with Theodore Roosevelt, uh, when we go around the country today and go to Wind Cave National Park, or um, whether or um, Glacier, or you know any of the great national parks and monuments, to look at the that the conservation movement and how important it is in this country when we're we're turning inwards to save our last wilderness areas. And I think it's the Theodore Roosevelt as conservationist is what the Republican Party can learn the most from. Um, by studying how important that is and not leaving that just to be a democratic issue. It should be an American issue to save the last remnants of our, our, our wilderness. I'd look at it a little bit differently. Um, I think Theodore Roosevelt's greatest legacy is, is who he was, that someone of such great intellectual powers, someone of such intellectual depth, uh, such moral depth, would choose politics and would choose government. There's a, an Englishman once called politics an honorable adventure. And I think to me, that's Theodore Roosevelt. I think he embodies that. And 
public life doesn't have to be disappointing. Public life doesn't have to be sort of low and pandering. I mean, to me, this man, sure he made his compromises. Sure he trimmed. Certainly he manipulated. We all do that in, we do that in private life as well as public, but there is something that is wonderfully elevating about him, wonderfully inspiring. That's, that's what I'd like to see. Okay, uh, thank you, John Milton Cooper and uh, Douglas Brinkley. Those were some views from the Academy, but does Teddy Roosevelt's presidency provide any concrete lessons for a politician on the edge of the 21st century? To find out, we now go to Albany, New York for a short chat with Roosevelt fan and successor, Governor George Pataki. Welcome to Think Tank, Governor Pataki. Uh, I understand you are an admirer of Teddy Roosevelt. In fact, you've even named one of your sons for him. Is that right? Uh, I've got a, a son named Teddy, and I've got a couple of pictures in the offices, and uh, I just always really uh, uh, admired Teddy Roosevelt. But really, the first uh, time that I became more intellectually exposed to what he stood for, as opposed to just the image of the, the, of the rough rider and the, and the president pounding his hand into his fist to make the case, was uh, uh, my freshman year at Yale when I had John Morton Blum teaching uh, History 35, and he talked about the, uh, the Republican Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, and what he stood for. And the intellectual legacy and political legacy to the country and everything from the national parks to the to the fact that we do have such an open and competitive market system economy today uh, and our role on the international scene so much of that uh, goes back to Teddy Roosevelt and we just passed in New York uh, a few weeks ago uh, a clean water clean air environmental bond act a 1.75 billion dollar bond act uh, and I don't think that would have happened it would have passed if people in New York didn't know Teddy Roosevelt used to be our governor. Uh, he's the guy who created this network of national parks. And as part of his legacy, as we look to the next century, we're going to do an even better job here in New York in protecting the environment and creating and expanding our parks than Teddy Roosevelt did at the beginning of the last century. Now, Governor, those are some pretty progressive issues you were talking about, and yet you are regarded as a conservative. Is it possible to be uh, both progressive and conservative at the same time? There's no question, and that's what uh, Teddy Roosevelt was. He was an activist, he was a progressive. He saw right from wrong, uh, but he was also a conservative in the sense that he believed in limited government. Uh, and the solution to the trusts was, uh, was the, the classic indication of that. In Europe, uh, among some American uh, liberal democratic politicians, the solution would have been to take over U.S. Steel or take over uh, some of the rail lines. But Teddy Roosevelt wanted a fair system. He wanted competition. He wanted the the give and take of a market system, but he didn't want an unfair system. So he went in, used the government power to break up the trusts so that the, those smaller entities to, could compete fairly. And I think if you take a look at uh, Teddy Roosevelt's history, it's very different from Woodrow Wilson's history. Woodrow Wilson believed in a, in a much bigger government uh, controlling things. Teddy Roosevelt believed in government as an umpire. Uh, making sure that uh, if you did something wrong, you were penalized or you were kicked off the field so that right could triumph, but not because government picked out who was right, but what was right and allowed the competitors to decide who was going to do the best job. What about uh, Teddy Roosevelt's foreign policy? Wasn't that uh, fairly activist as well? I think uh, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, aggressive foreign policy was very much uh, in tune with his view of right and wrong and his view of America. Uh, he believed that America had the ability to do things right and that we were a society where everyone had the, the ability to be free and participate and ultimately he said time and again that the government is the people and the people are the government and he believed that and because of that I think he saw a special role for the United States government in the world, uh, sending out the great white fleet to raise the flag and let people know that uh, America is not just an insular uh, country but a world power committed to that same sense of right and wrong at the world level and uh, I just think that uh, what he did uh, was lay the, the, the foundation for the enormous growth in the 20th century economically uh, and take that American flag to the corners of the world and say that we're here. We're on the, on, on the international scene. Uh, we're around for a long time uh, and you better listen to us because we have a very clear uh, view of what is right and what is wrong. And uh, uh, the, the successor to that was Ronald Reagan, uh, who 
took a look at the, the Soviet Union and said, this is an evil empire and the wall must come down. And uh, I think if you have confidence in your country, your people, the institutions of America, uh, it makes it lo a lot easier to deal with the, some of the international problems than having an ambiguous feeling about right and wrong about or about the, uh, our nation. And Teddy Roosevelt had that, Ronald Reagan had that, and I think it led to enormous international success. Okay, in Albany, New York, Governor George Pataki Thank you so much for joining us on Think Tank. Ben, thank you. It was a lot of fun being with you. And thank you. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.